OK. Hi, everyone. This is Miriam Naime from the Alan Turing Institute and Newcastle University. Welcome to our SuperGen Smart Charging webinar series. The webinar is an activity of the vehicle grid integration at the Alan Turing Institute. The Turing is the national institute in the UK for data science and artificial intelligence. And one of the objectives of the institute is to apply data science methods to real world problems, such as what we're doing in the vehicle grid integration group, where we are supporting the decarbonization of transport and electricity infrastructure. Several episodes so far covering communication protocols for electric vehicles, regional and national strategies for the rollout uh, of electric vehicle charging infrastructure and cybersecurity. You can find uh, the information uh, of uh, previous episodes on our landing page and check out our YouTube playlist for the videos. Next week, we are hosting the talk on EEBUS, another communication protocol that could be used in the context of uh, EVs with a speaker from EEBUS and a speaker from Audi. Today we are talking about cryptography. Cri cryptography facilitates the provision of secure services and systems that are part of our everyday lives, such as cash withdrawal from an ATM machine. We are delighted to host Nadim Kobesi to speak to us about modern cryptography in the context of electric vehicles. Nadim is the director of Symbolic Software a Paris-based applied cryptography consulting office. He authored Verifpal, a new software for verifying the security of cryptographic protocols, and he, he designed and teaches a computer security course at New York University in Paris. He also hosts a weekly podcast if you wanted to know more information about the latest developments in theoretical and applied cryptography. Uh, if you have questions, please leave them in the chat box, a chat box and we'll take them towards the end. And with that, without further ado, Nadim, over to you. Thank you very much, Miriam. Uh, can you guys hear me OK? Just checking. Yes, we can hear you. Great. OK, well, uh, thank you so much for this uh, uh, privilege and great opportunity to uh, discuss work that I am very passionate about um, here with you guys. Uh, I know that um, you're, you, you have a lot of work going on on electric vehicles, and I sincerely hope that I'm able to share insight today that may be useful to you uh, in your work moving forward. So I've prepared this presentation. Uh, I don't have a lot of slides, but that is because I also have some hands-on demonstrations that I hope will uh, give you more of a feel for the kind of work that uh, I'll be discussing today and introducing today, and especially how it can be relevant to electric vehicles and use cases in electric vehicles that can benefit from cryptography. OK, so about me, I am a applied cryptography researcher. I got my PhD just two years ago from Inria Paris, uh, accredited by Ecole Normale Supérieure Paris. I have fancy publications and uh, I have some research projects uh, in protocol verification, which is the thing that I do generally. I verify the security of cryptographic protocols uh, and design secure crypt Cryptographic protocols or break insecure cryptographic protocols, so such as TLS or Signal or Noise or MQTT or PGP and other protocols. In that, I have two uh, research projects, uh, Noise Explorer and Verifpal, which I'll be discussing today. Not because I'm trying to uh, sell my work, really, I'm not. Uh, this is These are genuinely, by complete coincidence, things that are very relevant to the context of uh, EVs, especially today given that there is no real standard protocol or set of protocols for the use case of, electri of electric vehicles. And there is still a sort of exploratory phase when it comes to deciding what kind of protocol discipline to adapt uh, for, for, for EVs. So uh, this is really interesting. It's, I'm, I'm personally quite excited that I'm able to say that I have research, original research that could be relevant to you guys and that I can explain uh, to you today. Uh, currently, I work at Symbolic Software, but that's already been discussed, so I'll just skip that part. OK, so about this presentation, we're going to be discussing these four to topics. So we're going to be discussing the cryptographic protocols that are useful for electronic vehicles, electric vehicles. Uh, we also need to talk about lightweight cryptography considerations. So we need to sort of talk about power usage, um, being able to run cryptographic primitives and cryptographic protocols in constrained environments, 
And I don't really think that a car these days qualifies as a constrained environment since it's so easy to get relatively powerful computers inside of a car. But a car key or a car charging station may very well qualify as a constrained embedded environment. And that these are considerations that we would have to take in mind. Also, given that cars last a long time and given that the uh, update of car hardware and firmware is not 100% guaranteed, we need to talk about ensuring protocol durability on long-term hardware, such as a car that you buy to last you perhaps a decade or more, perhaps two decades. Um, and also, ver in line with that, since we want cryptography to last, we want to make sure that we are able to verify the security of, um, let me see if I can use a pen here. Yep, verify the security of protocol implementations and specifications so that we can be formally certain that we are uh, using cryptography that is reliable and independent uh, so that we don't have to throw cars out if we cannot update their firmware. And, and in all of these topics, we have to take into, into consideration use cases that are relevant for electric vehicles. I am drawing using my trackpad. <laughs> let, me, let me connect my mouse so that I'm you know, making more sense here. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's even worse. Great. So cryptographic use cases for electronic vehicles, such as software updates, uh, DRM. Uh, DRM, you know, I'm, I'm kind of like conflicted to even bring this up, but some electric vehicle manufacturers, such as Tesla, for example, sell you a car with seated, uh, with heated seats, lock that feature. So they have to unlock it with like an in-app purchase, but for your car so that you get heated seats. And sadly, this is something that cryptography can facilitate. Uh, remotely unlocking your car, especially these days, you know, at the uh, penultimate Apple keynote, there was this, uh, when they announced the new iPhones, I think, or maybe it was the one before that, they had this thing where they could show, like, they, like Apple has this new API where you can sort of, car manufacturers can program uh, electric car unlock into the iPhone, and so that's something to consider. Uh, internal authentication between components, tamper resistance, uh, prohibiting the usage of counterfeit parts, for example, interfacing securely with charging stations, negotiating charging uh, voltages and so on, and also uh, potentially intercar communication. So one thing to keep in mind is that um, I am a protocols guy, I am a use case guy, but I am, and I, I think, you know, I can, I'm confident I can speak about these uh, topics and I, sincerely hope that I'm able to offer valuable information. However, I am not a electric vehicles guy. So I sincerely do not know very much about electric vehicles. I have tried in preparing for this presentation to inform myself on the use cases as much as possible, but I cannot say that I have fully targeted them. And later on in this uh, uh, seminar, I'm hoping to solicit your feedback so that I can cater uh, the information that I share and the topics that we discussed today to be more most useful to use cases that perhaps I have missed because I have never owned an electric vehicle. I have never worked with electric vehicles. As a matter of fact, I don't know how to drive. So uh, definitely feedback in that respect would be useful. So uh, let's talk about cryptographic protocols for electric vehicles. So generally speaking, things to consider in cryptographic protocols include, of course, security goals. Uh, a very common security goal is confidentiality. So we have two parties that are exchanging information with one another. We want to make sure that uh, information exchange is confidential against being learned from an unauthorized third party. Authentication, which means that uh, car A and car B or car A and charging station B uh, know that they're talking to each other and not some impersonator and also know that the exchanges between them are tamper proof. And we also have post-compromise security, which I strongly believe is not relevant here, um, but is, is definitely something that is useful, for example, in secure messaging. Whereas if, so for example, if you've ever used WhatsApp or Signal, you have benefited from post-compromise security because if your device gets stolen, then your messages cannot be decrypted in retrospect, or rather most of your messages cannot be decrypted in retrospect. Uh, from recovered wire communications. And that is because um, keys are ephemeral, they are refreshed frequently, and uh, but I, I don't know. I, I don't really see this happening in or being useful in the case of electric vehicles. Although perhaps it could be if you take into consideration the avoidance of replay attacks or maybe um, someone impersonating a charging station, trying to replay a handshake between a car and a, and a charging station. It could be useful. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. 
Number of parties. TLS is a two-party protocol. TLS is a really big deal. People talk about TLS all the time, but it is largely, unless you hack together extensions or something, restricted to two parties. And that is something to keep in mind, uh, maybe if you want to talk about situations where you have more than two parties. Um, in a sense, TLS also is a end-to-end -end encryption protocol, but um, in, in, in practice, this tends to mean different things. You know, if you use TLS in the regular HTTPS scenario, it is an end to end, it, 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 is, a it is a transport layer protocol, but it doesn't really have the same sort of practical uh, effect as a bona fide end to end protocol such as Signal, but that's, that's something we'll talk about later. Um, server components tend to uh, strongly differentiate the actual confidentiality and security guarantees that are obtained, because largely whenever you have a server, you're assuming that that server can see clear text constantly and generally is, is relaying that clear text between the initiator and some responder who is receiving ciphertext also, but the server is, is, is basically able to read all the clear text in between. Um, I was asked to mention PKIs, public key infrastructure, because that is something that is relevant to um, electric vehicles, and I can see why. You, you would need to use certificates and you would need to use uh, a chain of authority in order to establish perhaps um, software updates, authentication, uh, managing features and uh, cap cap capabilities on cars, authenticating uh, charging stations and so on. And this is something that we'll keep in mind during this presentation. Um, and of course, uh, one thing that is important is to um, look at the computational and hardware surface area costs. So basically, can my car run this protocol? Is it going to be overly expensive in terms of, in terms of uh, hardware, in terms of computational cost? This is something that, of course, again, we have to keep in mind. Now, um, in my prior discussion with Miriam in preparation for this talk, as well as uh, some research that I've done online, people seem to really default to TLS a lot. And this surprises me um, as someone who works in the field of applied cryptography protocols and who sees a lot of protocols. But then when you step out, you realize that most people don't really see a lot of protocols and TLS is the you know, sort of default protocol for transport layer encryption for good reason. It's a great protocol. It's, it's the most actively used protocol probably for application layer security and sorry, transport layer security and uh, web security. But um, at the same time, it is really intuitively, like directly to me, it is not something that we should be considering for most things, if not all things, when it comes to uh, electric vehicles. I, I do not immediately see any value whatsoever to using TLS with the possible exception of certificates, the fact that certificates are very good, um, a very sort of very embedded uh, design attribute of TLS. So TLS and certificates go hand in hand. It is very difficult to use TLS without uh, really like uh, thinking a lot about certificates and integrating certificate. And that gives you a more fine grained uh, sort of default authentication method. You can uh, you're going to be using certificates with TLS anyway, and so you might as well, you know, restrict your TLS implementation such that it uh, only accepts certificates from I don't know Toyota or or uh, a certain car manufacturer. Uh, you can do certificate pinning. You can sort of uh, authenticate based on certificates, but. I think that also this can be misleading in terms of how much sort of authentication it can give you, how 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 special it makes TLS. And uh, in general, I want to sort of, uh, I think that in terms of cryptographic rec recommendations, in terms of focusing on the use cases that are relevant to electric vehicles, you know, when I was thinking about this talk and the sort of recommendations I would give in that scenario, immediately it appeared to me that TLS is not suitable. There is something else that I find more suitable, which I will now introduce and argue for. Um, and this is for a number of reasons. So first, TLS is largely inflexible. It is, you know, it's designed for client-server interactions. The handshake of TLS is very expensive uh, relatively to other protocols. It, it, there's a lot of steps. The implementations are difficult. And by having certificates, I mean, 
um, certificates are written using uh, this language or this sort of like, um, not language, like the structure uh, called uh, X509, which is based on a format called ASN1. And these are really old formats that have sort of arbitrary length fields and are really, really hard to parse securely. And you have this giant stack, which is largely like oh, most of these libraries for parsing these sort of like X509 and ASN1 formats are written in stuff like uh, C uh, implementations. And this stuff is known for introducing a lot of low-level security vulnerabilities. So c certificates don't really come for free. There is a lot of security vulnerabilities associated with having certificates, with parsing certificates. And to the point that there is even some work on having formally verified ASN1 parsers. And this is something I briefly worked on during my PhD as well. Um, but generally, this is something that you don't want inside a car because of, you know, partially because of other factors like cars being hardware that you don't want to have to update frequently, but also because they are basically very large, you know, bodies that move around physically. And so the compromise of a car can have, um, um, physically compromising factors and dangerous factors in a very immediate sense. So you do want to reduce the attack surface. Now, is the attack surface of a ASN1 parser, a certificate parser, something that is a cryptographic concern? No, it is not. It's an application security concern. And so this is not something I'm going to focus on, but it does seem to me like you would want to have a very lightweight protocol, not only with cryptographic, not only with reduced cryptographic points of failure, but also with reduced implementation points of failure seems to me like this is something that would be very important. Um, and also, you can't really customize TLS for varied use case scenarios. But so my really, I mean, I, I really feel bad because uh, <laughs> like, I, I think that the best solution for um, electric vehicles, you know, I promise this is not because I'm working on this as, you know, so this is, I didn't make this. It's called the noise protocol framework. Someone else made this, fair repair, and I have nothing to do with them. Uh, but uh, it is something that I've spent a lot of time researching on, and I've published a paper on this, on formally verifying the noise protocol framework. And I assure you, by complete coincidence, I really think that this is the best thing to use for electric vehicles. Um, the thing that, you know, I've been working on for a while. Uh, so why, why do I believe this? So essentially, the noise protocol framework is actually not a protocol. It is a framework for deriving protocols. And... Um, it allows you to basically design a protocol flow that corresponds to your use case. And this is something that is really great because when we talk about electric vehicles, we are talking about a scenario where we have a bunch of use cases, right? Software update, DRM, remote car unlock, internal authentication between components, tamper resistance, talking to charging stations, and intercar communication. We have all of these use cases. And we basically are starting with the use case. We don't know what the protocol is. We want to describe to some oracle, you know, the kind of constraints that we have. And these constraints can be very serious in the case of the, you know, the, the car fob, for example, that unlocks the car. And then based on that, we want to get a protocol that works for our use cases. And then once we have that protocol, we want to be able to say, uh, we want to be able to ask, is this protocol secure, right? And so this is great. The noise protocol framework allows us to do all of this. So it is actually already in use uh, by one, at least one, one that I know of, really big car manufacturer, like one of the big, big ones. Uh, they didn't ask me not to tell, you know, they didn't ask me not to share the name, but I just won't because I haven't asked them whether it's okay or not. And I don't want to be rude, but well, a big shot car manufacturer is using noise uh, to, to do stuff really related to electric vehicles. So it does have some usage. Uh, let me show you what I mean. So, um, this is my browser. So, um, can you guys see my web browser right now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so this is Noise Explorer. Uh, no, let's start with noise itself. Hold on. So noise is a protocol framework. It is uh, created by a, um, a very well-known and brilliant uh, cryptography uh, engineer and applied cryptographer called Trevor Perrin, who is also behind the Signal protocol used in Signal and, and uh, WhatsApp. 
along with uh, his uh, co-author on Signal, Moxie Marlin Spike. And this is a basically, it describes not a protocol, but a protocol that generates protocols. This sounds very complicated and esoteric, but it's not. And so using Noise Explorer, we can basically use the Noise Protocol Framework to describe protocols relevant to our use case, and then immediately we can understand the security goals that these protocols uh, give us, as well as uh, basically also obtain implementations for them in Go and in Rust. But we'll talk about that later. That's not what's important right now. So here are a bunch of protocols generated using the Noise Protocol Framework. Let's just click on whatever, this one. Or no, maybe, yeah, this one is fine. Okay. So this over here on the on the uh, left, uh, let me let me see if I can make this larger. No, let's see. Okay, so here on the left, you will see that we have an arrow going left with an S on top. And then we have three ellipses. And then we have an arrow going right and an arrow going left. And each arrow has a bunch of letters on top of it. This, according to the noise protocol framework, is in fact a complete description of a cryptographic protocol. And the noise protocol framework allows you to describe your own cryptographic protocols. So basically, uh, and, and Noise Explorer is a tool that I created that facilitates this, right? And this is research that was published at the IEEE Security and Privacy uh, thing, European Symposium. So this is science, you know, actual science. <laughs> and uh, you, you can describe your protocol here, and it kind of tells you what the security guarantees are using formal verification, which is a thing that I will talk about later in this seminar. Okay, so what, the, what do these arrows mean? Uh, arrows occurring before the ellipses mean that this is information that is shared beforehand. So here on the left, we have Alice, A, and here on the right, we have Bob, B, okay? So Bob, prior to anything happening, is sending Alice his uh, S, which means um, long-term uh, um, long um, public key, right? So S is long-term public key, and E is uh, ephemeral uh, public key, um, meaning short-term public key. Generally speaking, in protocols, uh, for example, the TLS equivalent of S would be the public key of the certificate, right? So this is a public key that is signed by a certificate authority and that doesn't change, hence the, uh, def hence the attribute of long-term. And ephemeral keys are keys that change often. So uh, perhaps with every session or every message, we, you will have a different ephemeral key, right? Um, the point of long-term keys, given that they do not change, is to have um, a way to guarantee identity authentication. So if, if we have keys that change all the time, we would not be able to guarantee the identity of someone because we would not have like a point of reference. But if we have a key that never changes, we can have that key signed by a certificate authority, as is the case with TLS. Or for example, you could have that key signed by the car manufacturer, given you know we certified this key is supposed to represent this car or is supposed to represent this signing uh, this this charging station right and then ephemeral keys are meant to guarantee post compromise security right by by keeping cryptographic key material fresh right and so here it means that bob is sending to alice this shared secret before any protocol happens and then on the first message Alice will send to Bob her ephemeral public key. Alice will do a Diffie-Hellman key uh, handshake to establish a shared secret between her ephemeral key and Bob's shared uh, Bob's uh, long-term public key. Uh, she will also send to Bob her long-term public key, and she will also calculate a, a Diffie-Hellman shared secret between her public key, long-term public key, uh, and Bob's long-term sorry between her long-term private key and Bob's long-term public key. Right. So, are you guys familiar with Diffie-Hellman? I just want to make sure before I go on. Maybe a very brief uh, intro on it. So, yes, thank you. So Diffie-Hellman is a basically just uh, the standard way to calculate public key uh, shared secrets. So in public key cryptography, probably the most used primitive, well, there's also RSA, but let's put that aside for now, is Diffie-Hellman. So, Generally, whenever in public key cryptography you see someone with a with a public key and someone else with a private key, you know uh, they're sending me their public key, and I have my private key, and I can calculate um, their the shared secret, and then I send them my public key, 
and they send me their private key. Sorry, I send them my public key and using their private key, they calculate a shared secret as well. This is how we establish shared keys to use for encryption over an insecure channel or a monitored channel, but hopefully an authenticated one. Um, I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't expect to have to introduce Diffie Hellman. Perhaps that's I should have. Fine, that's fine, um, you don't have to. That's, I thought you, it was needed. We, we can, you can keep going, it's okay. Okay, thank you. So essentially, when you describe a protocol using the noise protocol framework, using these, using this notation, this specification for the noise protocol framework actually defines like, like there's this internal machine that interprets these glyphs, these tokens, and based on that, performs a series of, of, internal, of internal calculations to basically use the exchanged key material to the fullest extent possible. And that leads you to a situation where you have, so basically let's look at, so Noise Explorer allows you to examine this in more detail, hence the Explorer um, suffix. So here we can see that, you know, message A, this is message A, right? Message A sent by the initiator benefits from receiver authentication, but is vulnerable to key compromise impersonation. Like it gives you all of these pieces of information and shows you exactly which operations are done at the behest of every token that is shared, right? And uh, this is basically a way to easily, quickly understand what are the security guarantees and what are the operations that you're getting out of every protocol that you care to design or that you care to investigate or explore using Noise Explorer. And then we have a series of uh, queries, right? On each protocol, each message, in fact, of each protocol, authentication grade one, authentication grade two, authentication grade three, authentication grade four, the same for confidentiality up to grade five. And you can, you can quickly see exactly which properties hold. So in the case of authentication grade one, you know, in this query, we test for sender authentication and message, uh, message integrity, meaning that if Bob receives a valid message from Alice, then Alice must have sent that message to someone or at least had, uh, or, or Alice had their static key compromised before the session began, or Bob had their static key compromised. And then if you look at, for example, grade four, we test for sender and receiver authentication and uh, compromise, key compromise impersonation resistance. This is, this is, I think, a typo. If Bob receives a valid message from Alice, then Alice must have sent that message to Bob specifically, which is more of a security guarantee than, Bob, than Alice having sent that message to someone, not necessarily Bob specifically. Or Alice had their static key compromised before the session began. So when you're using Noise Explorer, you're starting with, for example, I know that, uh, let's look at the car key scenario, right? Where I can assume that perhaps the car key has prior knowledge of the public long-term key for the car. So IK works in that respect, right? So let's say that the initiator over here on the left is the car key and on the right you have the car. So we can say that the car key is pre-configured with a long-term public key for the car. So this works out actually so far. And then the actual protocol for, key un for car unlock could involve the car generating a ephemeral key, sending its long-term key, but as a matter of fact, we can also assume that the car, that the, sorry, that the, yes, that the car also has the long-term key of the car key, right? So we can look for a pattern where, there we go. Both car key and car are pre-authenticated, right? So they have pre-exchanged their long-term keys. This, this gives us easy authentication beforehand, right? And uh, based on that, we can basically just do a key exchange with mutually pre-authenticated parties. So this will give us, uh, e this will make it easier for us to get uh, authentication security guarantees earlier on in the protocol exchange. And for example, we could decide based on the level of mutual authentication and the sort of level of cryptographic capabilities that are allowed for us by our use case scenario, we can decide that this is a useful protocol for us to investigate for the car key to car scenario. However, if you look at, for example, car to charging station scenario, this is not a scenario in which you can have a free exchange, like the car cannot magically know the long-term public key of the charging station before 
it uh, meets the charging station because the car did not ship with the charging station. The car and the charging station were not configured by the same manufacturer. Or yes, in the case of the charging key, the car key, they were both manufactured by uh, uh, Nissan, Toyota, whatever, and uh, they can be mutually pre-authenticated. And so this noise protocol, uh, this noise handshake pattern actually could work. But we have we have to find a different one for the charging station to the car. So in the case of the charging station and the car, actually no prior exchange of keys can occur. And so we can look around and we can say, hmm, we can't expect the car to have a long-term key, but it actually it has no value to the charging station. However, the charging station having a uh, long-term key could be useful to the car, right? And so be, because the car can basically keep track of that key, maybe use it for um, better authentication in the future, who knows? But it, 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 it could be envisioned that a charging station having a long-term key could make sense. In, in a charging use case, but a car having a long-term key doesn't really seem to be valuable. So this is perhaps a protocol. No, I won't actually use uh, Also, uh, by the way, um, well, it's not, it's not, it's not useful. You could also have protocols with pre-shared keys and that would actually make, probably make more sense for the car key, but that's fine. Um, I don't know. This could be a protocol, for example, where we say that the initiator is the charging station, the responder is the. Oh no, sorry. This is actually involves pre-authentication. Mm, where is a protocol that is where you do have the exchange of a long-term key from one party, but there is no pre-authentication? Oh, this one. I, I'm just choosing these at random. You know, it's it's not. I, I, the, these are not exactly recommendations that I'm making. I'm just showing you that noise protocol framework is something that could be used to find protocols that are, you know, relevant to use cases where you know you have the charging station, you're connecting the car to the charging station, boom, you get a long-term public key and an ephemeral public key, you know, S and E, and then the car can respond. And by message B, you already have you know, sender and receiver authentication and resistance to key compromise and personation. So basically you're able to start off with your use case. You know, we have, we have, we have shown that a car key use case is different from a charging station use case. And based on that use case, you can determine what is the protocol that can actually work for your use case. And then once you've found a protocol that is compatible as we have now, you can immediately understand what are the security guarantees on a fine grained level that you can obtain from this protocol. So I think that when you have a scenario such as um, car, uh, you know, electric vehicles and all of these use cases, which I think are largely unexplored and uh, could benefit from understanding, you know, what are the security guarantees that you need? What are the use case constraints between uh, for all of these scenarios? Uh, something like the noise protocol framework makes a lot of sense, right? And so you can basically look at, okay, well, for software update, frankly, I think TLS is great because software update, you're basically doing it inside the car. You're probably doing it from the uh, like sort of like touch interface, like the weird like little tablets that come in cars, like the car iPad. And so there you're kind of like unconstrained and you're basically probably learning some sort of, some sort of Linux uh, operating system and you can just do TLS, download the thing and do certificate pinning and you're done, right? But for other things like uh, car DRM, Remote car unlock, as discussed, a charging station, as discussed, intercar communication, um, and also internal authentication between components and tamper resistance, which is pretty much the same as on internal authentication between car components. You definitely start to see the value of something like noise, where you can cater a light leak protocol to that specific use case, right? And also, Noise Explorer is cool because it lets you generate uh, implementations written in Rust. And in Go for the uh, protocol that you're investigating, and then you can prototype these implementations. So this is a Go implementation of the protocol directly generated, and these are actually secure to use. Uh, you can also get a download of Rust implementation. Rust is, I think, a very good choice for electric vehicles because it's a low-level language. I don't think that Go is obviously a good choice for electric vehicles. I love Go. It's my favorite programming language, but it is uh, not a good idea for low-level um, systems, as I'm sure everyone here would agree. So, okay, well, that's noise. 
let's move on. So I, I, I've been, you know, sort of justifying noise by saying that it's a lightweight protocol. We also have to talk about lightweight ciphers because in the context of electric vehicles, we cannot be sure that all of the components, including definitely car keys, have the ability to run advanced cryptographic primitives. Uh, um, not advanced, I would say, uh, expensive cryptographic primitives, uh, computationally heavy cryptographic primitives. Uh, signatures, for example, tend to be very slow. Definitely among the standard or um, sort of like vanilla cryptographic primitives, if you put aside you know, things like zero-knowledge proofs and things that we really don't need to talk about, signatures tend to be the slowest and most expensive computation. Uh, and it's quite nice, actually, that the noise protocol framework does not support signatures. Doesn't need signatures, doesn't use signatures, but you still have public key cryptography, which is very heavy. But at the same time, uh, Curve 25519, the most popular uh, public key cryptography, Diffie Hellman primitives, well, is it really the most popular? I think so, yeah, with, the, with its introduction in TLS 1.3 and also the fact that Apple uses it everywhere and everyone uses it everywhere. Signal, WhatsApp, yes, it is probably the most popular one right now. It has been optimized to death. You know, like if you, it's so optimized right now. You can get it, it it's run so much faster than it used to a few years ago. And um, I guess, you know, when you're talking about primitives, especially public key primitives, you have to worry about post-quantum resistance. The There is the NIST post-quantum competition that is happening right now. The NIST, which is the National Institute for Standards and Technology, uh, American Institute, is currently standardizing uh, primitives that are resistant to quantum attacks using quantum computers, which do not, not exist yet, but could in the near future. Uh, they recently selected uh, another round of finalists, and it really seems that lattice-based cryptography is going to win. However, lattice-based cryptography, while fast generally, I mean, I think it's fast if you just want to use it for, you know, on, on a smartphone uh, or, or any uh, relatively unconstrained environment like a desktop, or a laptop, or even like a television set, or a video game set, um, or a tablet, is still not as fast as, it's actually, I believe, many times slower than something like Curve 25519, even in optimized implementations. So NIST actually has another uh, lightweight cryptography, has another competition that is that focuses on lightweight cryptography. So this, competition is but I, I actually i think the this this competition concerns itself mostly with symmetric primitives hmm. i wonder whether hold on so there are several emerging areas sensor networks healthcare distributed control systems the internet of things which i guess includes electric vehicles cyber physical systems which i guess also includes electric vehicles in which highly constrained devices are interconnected zoom in typically communicating wirelessly with one another and working in concert to accomplish some task. Because the majority of current cryptographic algorithms were designed for desktop server environments, many of these algorithms do not fit into constrained devices. So NIST is working on algorithms that are more lightweight, um, but are they working on symmetric primitives only? Because all of the primitives that I've seen here actually are only symmetric primitives, and I'm not sure that... Um, can we look at the finalist at least? There, round two candidates. Let's see. Yes, I believe that all of these are symmetric. Symmetric primitives are basically non-public key primitives. So hash functions, um, encryption functions, uh, authentication, you know, the message authentication code generation functions. Um, kind of unfortunate that it doesn't even say, but I, 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 so ASCON for sure is symmetric. Yes, this is, authentic, this is authenticated encryption. I think all of them are authenticated encryption or hashing primitive. Frankly, not sure. There's a lot of them, wow. Uh, okay, so this is, this is what NIST is preparing, but this also brings us to the problem of cipher suites. So basically, when you decide on a cipher that you want to use, you basically have to decide on the public key primitive, you know, generally curve 25519 uh, for Diffie-Hellman for uh, 
shared secret establishment. But you also want to decide on the encryption primitive, authenticated encryption. Generally, it's something like AES or ChaCha20, or some of these lightweight primitives, hopefully when one of them is finalized soon. Or you want to, and you also want to decide on a hash primitives, perhaps. And so this collection of primitives is called the cipher suite, right? And cipher suites are very popular in TLS. You know, generally the server and the web browser will negotiate for suite to use based on what collection of ciphers are supported by both client and server. So you might end up with the TLS RSA uh, AES CCM cipher suite. And basically that would be RSA for public key cryptography and AES for AES CCM for uh, encryption, right? Or TLS uh, curve to 5519 uh, cha-cha poly where Curve 25519 is used for um, uh, shared secrets, and ChaCha Poly is used for uh, authenticated encryption. Now, when you're talking about ensuring protocol durability on long-term hardware, you're talking about not wanting to use cipher suites and not wanting to think about cipher suites or worry about cipher suites. Because cipher suites imply, uh, uh, well, generally, people see them as implying cryptographic agility. This is the term, agile cryptography. But agile cryptography exists because of the implication that cryptography needs to be agile because ciphers don't last relatively long and you might need to switch from one cipher to the other given perhaps new attacks or incompatibilities or other real world constraints that require you to jump from a bunch of ciphers to the next. And that's bad. It's bad for two reasons, because it means that you're gonna have to worry about uh, which ciphers your car supports in 10 years. You know, people change cars far less than they change mobile phones, far less often than they change mobile phones or desktops. But at the same time, having cipher suites implies uh, that you're going to have a negotiation step in your protocol to establish cipher suites. So your car is going to have to ask the charging station or the car key, well, hopefully not the car key, <laughs> but the charging station and whatever it connects to or even other cars that it connects to you know, it connects to what ciphers do you support? Other car or charging station? And the other car is going to be like, well, I only support the cipher that dates from 20 years ago. So I guess we're going to use that one. And this is known as a downgrade attack. And these are types of attacks that have affected TLS in the past many, 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 many times, many times, up to the recent past even, where you have uh, flaws in the protocol, specification, or implementation resulting in really old ciphers being used, like really, really old ciphers being used, like 1995 era ciphers being used. And uh, this is because of like really old code bases written in C where people think that they've locked those ciphers out, but they haven't really because you can hack into the state machine and jump into a position in the state where you are uh, using these ciphers now. And so generally speaking, you want to decide uh, especially in the context of electric cryptography, especially in the context of electric vehicles, on a set of trustworthy ciphers and stick to them, not have cipher suites. And when you feel that you need to move away from these ciphers, which should hopefully be never, which is possible, I think, I, not, not literally never, but at least for 10, 20 years, if you choose ciphers with a high security margin, then you can just roll out an entirely new version of the protocol itself not do what TLS did, which is keep the same protocol, the same protocol version, but just keep adding different combinations of cipher suites on top of each other, which led to uh, cipher suite constructions, combinations rather that were insecure. For example, using certain primitives with RC4, uh, a stream cipher. And uh, that, that is probably a better approach. So find uh, a set of lightweight primitives that work on your cars, that work on your constrained environment, that have a security margin that reasonably uh, shown by some cryptanalysis to guarantee security for a number of years in the future. And then based on that, you can go ahead and say that, yes, this is great. Uh, roll this out in the protocol. And then with the assumption that you're better off doing this, not complicating the protocol with an additional attack vector, keeping the agreement on which primitives to use to a minimum. And then if it happens that you need to change these primitives, you just roll out an entirely new version of the protocol. Um, there's also a paper that was published recently by Jean-Philippe Omasson, 
called Too Much Cryptography. Let's into this. Uh, let's take a look. Too Much Crypto by Jean-Philippe Omasson. So we show that many symmetric cryptography primitives would not be less safe with significantly fewer rounds. So basically, uh, Jean-Philippe is the author of the Blake 3 hash function, and he's arguing in this paper that many symmetric primitives uh, would, are, like people are, are, are exaggerating um, security margins, that there's this sort of numerology that is happening in, in cryptography and theoretical cryptography where people have too many rounds, where you can reduce the number of rounds and still obtain a high security margin. Now, you don't have to agree with Jean-Philippe on this, but you can, like, you, you can just keep the security margins that are you know, sort of given by default with many um, top of the line primitives, such as you know, the ones that Jean-Philippe considers, AES, Blake 2, Cha-Cha, and Cha-3, and you'll be fine. But, uh, and I'm not even, you know, I'm not selling this as basically following Jean-Philippe's advice, but rather realizing that security margins appear to be more than okay with existing ciphers. And these ciphers are generally not very expensive to run. And so maybe you don't even need lightweight ciphers. I'm actually not sure. Um, so I've, I've said that, you know, protocol durability is a cipher suite problem and not a protocol problem. Why is that? Well, it could be a protocol problem, but we are fairly certain that it isn't because of formal methods and verification on protocols. So that's what I do, right? I've mentioned that at the beginning. I look at protocols and I tell you if they're safe. I basically, uh, this is what Noise Explorer does. So Noise Explorer, as you can see, has a lot of, has a lot of conclusions, has a lot of, has made a lot of decisions about noise protocols. You know, whenever you give it something, it tells you, you know, that I think that, for example, this protocol on message B uh, is in fact passing authentication grade two and is in fact, uh, you know, passing confidentiality grade three, but failing confidentiality grade four. How does Noise Explorer come to these conclusions? Well, the way that it does is actually that Noise Explorer has run uh, a formal verification run on all of these protocols, we have written or rather automatically generated uh, a set of formal models, formal mathematical models for all of these protocols and run them using the Proverif protocol verification framework. Proverif is a uh, very well established framework for modeling and verifying cryptographic protocols. It is a automa automatic cryptographic protocol verifier in the formal model. Uh, based on a representation of a protocol by horn clauses. And so, generally speaking, Proverif and as well as the Tamarin Prover, uh, these are standard tools. I think Proverif has existed for over 20 years, and Tamarin has existed for also a very long time. Let me see how old Tamarin is. At least since 2012, right? Probably even before that. So, these tools have existed for quite some time. And essentially, they allow you to model a protocol uh, and obtain security guarantees on the security of the, of the protocol itself. And so Tamarin and Proverif have been used on noise, on TLS and Signal, and uh, basically um, work inside the symbolic model. And so in the symbolic model, you basically have a protocol model. You, you write out the uh, noise protocol framework, all of the primitives, describe how they function, describe the protocol exchange, describe the principles in the formal language of these tools. So in Proverif, that would be the applied by calculus. In Tamarin, that would be another language. I don't recall its name right now. And also there's the one uh, that I created called VerifPal, which we'll talk about in a bit. And so there are two ways to formally model and obtain ver um, security uh, results on cryptographic protocols. You can model them in the symbolic model or the computational model. The symbolic model um, described is less precise because when you describe, for example, an encryption function in the uh, symbolic model or a hashing function, it is mathematically perfect. You know, a hash function is a pure, flawless, one-way function. A encryption function is a pure, flawless, uh, random permutation function, right? And obviously, this is not the case in the real world. You know, there is no purely flawless uh, encryption function or hashing function or public key function and so on. And so 
in the symbolic model, you're dealing with algebraic, uh, no algebraic and no numeric values, just a bunch of pure symbolic logical representations. And this makes thinking about protocols perhaps easier, but also eliminates a lot of the fine grained analysis that you might like, such as uh, being able to describe uh, primitives with different security um, properties, such as NCPA and CCA, uh, different security bounds, uh, such as 128-bit or 6-bit or 64-bit or 80-bit uh, security. And the computational model verification also gives you secure, actual security proofs, gives you the actual game-based security proof. Whereas in symbolic model verification, you have a proof on the tool. So the tool, the framework, for example, Proverif and Tamarin, Verifpile doesn't actually have a proof, but um, Proverif and Tamarin have proofs that the tool is, is, is not going to miss an attack, for example, or, or, or perhaps find a false attack. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the proofs are on these tools, but uh, it depends on the tool. So, and in the case of computational model verification, you get an output of a complete proof. However, computational model verification is still very hard to use, extremely, in my opinion, hard to use for engineers, and also is not fully automated. You have to sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a proof assistant. So you have to guide the tool, and that takes time and effort. And also could be prone to misunderstandings and mistakes during the modeling and analysis and proof assisting process. Uh, in terms of verifying the security of implementations, so you can't use, um, you cannot use symbolic verification or computational protocol verification tools that I've talked about, such as Proverif, Tamarin, and Verifpal, and CryptoVerif, to verify um, primitives, such as encryption functions. There is a tool that I've recently started looking into called EasyCrypt for verifying primitives, but that is not something that you guys want to be doing as electric car engineers, right? Or researchers. Uh, in terms of verifying implementation security, you have to use a different set of tools because uh, these tools that I just described are for protocol specifications, not implementations, right? So if you look up Noise Explorer, for example, Noise Explorer can tell you that the spec, the specification for noise, according to Provera, satisfies these security goals. But it is not necessarily the case that these security goals translate to the implementation. The implementer might actually make errors that are not necessarily uh, explicitly visible in the specification, but that lead to uh, um, bugs such as uh, a machine or perhaps side channel attacks, such as timing attacks or, or power analysis attacks, right? And so there's this other project in formal verification called FSTAR. And F star is mind blowing. F star is just crazy town. You know, F star is the most ambitious thing I've ever seen in my life. Because in F star, it's a programming language where types are proofs. It's amazing. It's an incredible concept. Types, you know, the type system of the programming language is proofs. And that just blows my mind every time I think about this. Um, basically, they took OCaml. Because, because a lot of them are French and everyone in France loves OCaml. And it's, it's, it's a great choice because it's a purely functional programming language with a very sound uh, design decisions when it comes to syntax and semantics. And then they take OCaml and they tie it to Z3 as a type checker. And so the Z3 theorem prover is the type checker for the language. And so basically you can, like, for example, you're modeling, uh, not, not modeling, you're implementing, you know, Diffie-Hellman, Curve 25519, or, or you're implementing Blake 2 or Blake 3, or you're implementing... AS, and so you can basically, in the case of group 25519, you can type a value as being a valid on the elliptic curve, because curve 25519 is a cur elliptic curve-based cryptographic primitives, you know? And so the type checking passes if the point is proven to be a value on the curve, right? And this can be extended uh, ad nauseum, right? You can just, anything that can be modeled as a mathematical truth in the Z3 theorem prover, which is pretty much, I think, everything, from algebra to whatever, can in fact be fashioned into a type within a programming, within an OCaml-like, ML-like programming language. And so I don't know what these people, you know, I don't know what they do in their lives. It just it blows my mind that they're able to do this. Uh, I have been fascinated and intimidated by FSTAR ever since um, I started my PhD, and uh, it continues to blow my mind to this day. And a star is really expressive, right? So because that tree is really expressive, a star itself can also be really expressive. Um, 
And so they've been able to construct the Hackle Star, uh, Hackle H High Assurance Cryptographic Library. That's what it stands for. And uh, Hackle Star is just like a library of cryptographic primitives that are all written in a star and all proven to be form functionally correct. And all proven to, and they can even prove, so they can prove functional correctness using a star. Functional correctness means that it works exactly as it's meant to, and in no other way, you know, points on the curve and everything. And you can even prove side channel resistance in a star. So no timing attacks and so on. Mind blowing. And right down to the, uh, um, to the low level, right? Like right down to the CPU instructions. So this is, uh, by the way, FSTAR is made by Inria and by uh, Microsoft Research. I am not involved in FSTAR. Uh, and so they've also used FSTAR to do, so Microsoft Research has a project called Project Everest, and they're writing all of HTTPS in FSTAR, which is crazy, including like a, like a certificate parser in FSTAR. I don't believe it. And also Signal Star, which is like all of the signals of your messaging protocol in FSTAR. And also they're going to do, I think, noise in FSTAR. Right, so F star is like the sort of crazy mad scientist project when it comes to verifying implementations. Okay, so I wanted to talk more about. Well, wow, it's actually all, I'm an hour. I've been talking for an hour. That's incredible. wow. Okay, I had no idea. I thought I was talking for only like twenty or thirty minutes. Um, so um, I would like to briefly demonstrate how you can model and verify a protocol using VerifPal. Uh, because actually, so the way that VerifPal is different from ProVerif and um, Tamarin is that it is meant to be easy to use. So if you go back to my original slide here at the very beginning of this presentation, the description for VerifPal is VerifPal, cryptographic protocol analysis for students and engineers. The whole goal of the project is to have something that is easy to use for students and engineers. I was hoping to show you how you can model and think about a cryptographic protocol inside a formal uh, framework very quickly before the end of the presentation. But before I do that, I would like to ask Miriam if there is time for that. I'd like to see that. There are many comments and questions. Uh, yes, I'm so sorry. Let me let me no, perhaps fine, address those. It's fine. I'm just thinking if we take the questions now or if we do, how long would the verified presentation uh, uh, take? As, as much as you like. Uh, let me just, so, I'm just going to go through the questions first. I think and it's important. I have to, to explain that of academics and companies who are leading the deployment of charging infrastructure worldwide. So you'll have that. You'll have both pros and cons of what you said. So please do have a have a look, and then uh, uh, if I'm you want to raise some of the questions now, go ahead. Otherwise, please keep going. I will do that. I will yeah. do that. So are the questions inside the chat? The yes. Microsoft Teams chat. Yeah. Okay. So. I'm going to address the, section, the questions in order. So the first question from Roberto Metere, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is, is the long-term key assumed to be sent through a secure channel? Yes, Roberto, the long-term key is assumed to be sent through a secure channel and therefore pre-authenticated. That is the uh, point of long-term keys, is that they we, we assume them to be pre-authenticated and this fundamentally differentiates them from ephemeral keys. Uh, another question by Craig Rodin. There are PKA development efforts that include insertion of charging network public keys in electric vehicles. Perfect. That's good to know. A question by, oh, Friedrich Weimer, who I actually know. The NIST LW lightweight crypto competition asks for authenticated encryption ciphers, so all symmetric crypto, if that wasn't the question. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Akeem Friedland. No, rolling out a complete new version of a protocol is nothing that works in reality. That's a pure academic view of the problem. Hmm. That's a good point. I can I can see I can I can definitely I can definitely uh, see that that's a valid point. It's not. I mean, so yes. Yeah, so I think that there's a trade-off here. So basically, rolling out a new version of a protocol is hard, and you might need to wait for an entirely new generation of hardware until you're able to do this. I agree. However, um, at the same time, do you, I think that there's a trade-off. Do you have uh, these protocol rollouts, or do you are you perpetually stuck in a scenario where you have to have cipher suite negotiation, and you have to have ever growing cipher suites in all protocols forever? You know this can introduce a lot of um, points of failure, can really complicate the key exchange of every step and every protocol and every use case. Every single use case will have will probably have a more complicated. Key exchange a more complicated state machine 
more potential for downgrade attacks and so on. And these are attacks that have been exploited many, many times. You know, you look at the Smack TLS attack, Freak TLS attack, um, Sweet 64 TLS attack, Sloth TLS attack, Drown, uh, Poodle, all of, except for Poodle, I think, all of these are attacks that have something to do with the Cypher Suite, right? All of them. And these are real world attacks that have published like some blockbusting papers. Uh, if Akim uh, would like to respond, uh, uh, please, I, I, I'm looking forward to the response. I'm just going to continue reading these questions and then maybe I'll catch Akim's response at the bottom. Uh, from Craig Rodin, Bruce Schneier, old but good, warns us about two things. Always seek simplicity, but also novelty in crypto introduces risk. Well, is it is it really? But but I, I feel so. Craig is agreeing with Akim, but I also feel like actually Craig is agreeing with me because um, I am advocating for simplicity when I say that I don't want cipher suites. I explicitly do not want them because I do not want to have complicated by default key exchange, right? And so if you want cipher suites everywhere, you are against simplicity, I think. Now, novelty in crypto introduces risk, but there, that doesn't mean that you need novelty if you want to eliminate cipher suites. You can just rely on established cryptographic primitives, right? And so if I'm misunderstanding what Craig is saying, of course, I welcome uh, people um, writing more stuff and I'll read it. Paul Van Obel, I think Akim's comment was particularly targeted at the idea of using version rollover without protocol agility, backwards compatibility through negotiation within the protocol. This is what I'm advocating, by the way. This is what I think is good. Using version rollover without agility and backwards compatibility. I, I agree with this, which is not necessarily a novelty. Yes, thank you, Paul Van Obel. This is exactly the point I'm making. But there's definitely a discussion possible about the merits and drawbacks of each option. Yes, I completely agree with this comment. Robert Deliu. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Cypher suites and new protocol versions. If we look at OCPP 1.6 is now five years old. A lot of new equipment is still being rolled out with version 1.6. OCPP 2.0 has been available since two and a half years ago, but the step to migrate to 2.0 is seen as too big. If we want to keep 1.6 secure, if the Cypher suites and OCPP get broken, would you advise us to release a new version of OCPP? I'm sorry, I'm not familiar with OCPP. So OCPP I, I can't answer this question. It's a communication protocol between a charging station and a third party operator. Oh, I don't know. I, sorry, this seems, this seems like a very good question, but I'm just, I don't, I don't, I think I, I don't, I'm not qualified to answer this question. Uh, perhaps I, I think perhaps I can the, Robert's question was more about uh, the, the cipher suites and those protocols. So like, uh, uh, would they what? Would they release a new version of a protocol in general, no matter what the protocol is? I, I, I don't know. I mean, so I, I don't know what, what, what use case uh, in specific that Robert is describing, but generally, yes. Generally, I would advise against having cipher suites and uh, forcing a new version. At the same time, look, I... I, I really dislike people with like strong cryptographic opinions and I don't want to be one of these people. I don't think that there's a right decision, like a sort of right opinion and wrong opinion. And so I have been advocating this as generally speaking, something that I think is a good idea and as, as a ground rule. And I think that, for example, comments made by uh, Mr. Paul Van Obel definitely seem to be in line with my intuition on these things. However, when you have a lot of engineers in this chat, like for example, Mr. Akeem and Mr. Craig, and also Robert, um, you know, I, I feel like maybe this is something that also should be discussed, right? So I, again, have never worked with electric vehicles. I don't know what the constraints are. And if it so happens that this is a use case where you need to think more seriously about backwards compatibility and where the use case constraints in the real world are such that it is impossible to just roll out new versions and have everyone upgrade, then yes, perhaps these people have a point. And I, I don't want to impose my opinion without having a hands-on experience with the use case. I, ho I hope that's fair. Um, I'm going to do something differently in this uh, webinar. If people want to actually speak with Nadine, maybe raise their hand and I'll unmute you. Uh, are there many more questions to uh, comments to go through? Uh, I'm just reading quickly here. Yeah. I think that this is a, uh, I think that here we have a discussion between Craig and Akeem and not really a question. Okay. So I, uh, but if anyone has any, if, if, if I have missed a question, please type in the chat and I'll try to address it. 
Uh, Nadim, this is for me, an EV engineer rather than a security or communication protocol uh, engineer. It, remind me, why do we need an alternative to TLS? Um, I think that, uh, so in the beginning of the talk, I mentioned that I think it's better to focus on something like the noise protocol instead of TL, the noise protocol framework instead of TLS for a number of reasons. First, TLS implies certificate parsing and implies uh, using certificates, which means that you might have a lot of low-level vulnerabilities caused by certificate parsing, uh, given that certificates rely on very old methods of uh, describing a certificate and parsing a certificate, such as X509 and ASN1, which, has, which have arbitrary length fields and so on, which make writing secure parsers very difficult. And insecure low-level code is the last thing that you want inside a car, right? Or a car charging station. That is one argument. Another argument is that TLS is highly catered towards one specific use case and that you cannot basically uh, fashion it into a set of uh, protocols catered to different use cases you know i showed how for example the car key to car uh, communication use case is fundamentally different than the car charger to car use case and the noise protocol framework will allow you to, to develop a much more lightweight protocol uh, set of protocols rather that caters to these use cases giving you better performance, more lightweight cryptography, uh, perhaps even better security by eliminating points of failure. And because something like Noise Explorer allows you to study the security guarantees obtained by these protocols, you also obtain um, better assurance in that regard. Thank you. So especially with the lightweight uh, that you mentioned, do you think more car companies that similar to the one you've mentioned are going to also use Noise Protocol Framework? Uh, well, as I've mentioned, there is one major car company that is using the noise protocol framework right now, although I do not have uh, permission to, uh, or rather I have not asked them whether they're comfortable with revealing which company it is. No, yeah, no, 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 no uh, I wouldn't want the name. I was just wondering how come they reached that decision? Oh, I have not discussed this with them. I did not ask them, uh, but I believe that most likely my, I think, you know, the reasoning that I gave you is likely the reasoning that they adopted according to my perspective. Okay. The, yeah. the, the, the comparison that I gave to TLS is to me the comparison that uh, seems to be the most convincing one when comparing the noise protocol framework to TLS. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So if there's no more uh, specific questions on the presentation, if you wanted to continue with the demo. Um, okay. So um let's do that i i'm just trying oh so giorgio is actually uh someone who works with me so giorgio is actually uh, re my research assistant uh so i'm i i think he's asking the question to the audience not to myself and uh, i here i see that robert has replied to giorgio okay so uh very quickly and i hope this will be of interest to you i would like to show you verifpal so verifpal is my new anime uh, project. As you can see here, uh, it's, it's really fantastic. You know, we, we, have, we, we have a great show coming up. Just kidding, of course. So, <laughs> um, As a matter of fact, it is not an anime. It is a uh, formal verification tool for protocols. However, um, I really am catering it towards students and engineers, and as such, there is like this whole VerfPal like tutorial and, and manual that actually includes a manga with characters representing different cryptographic attacks and i'm very personally proud of this i very much like this and i think it makes verifpal a very pleasant and 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, special project especially for people trying to learn more about the field for example you can see here that verifpal is going through an adventure in the user manual where uh, she uh, finds attacks and then is interrupted by a, uh, a giant robot uh, piloted by the antagonist who is called mayor nd middle an obvious reference to man in the middle attack Right, so I, I love Verifpal. It's really my my favorite research project. Um, and so, anyway, let's let's look at um, let's look at how Verifpal works. So, uh, you know, as a matter of fact, I've been speaking for an hour. So, I'm going to show you this video <laughs> here. Please enjoy this this presentation that uh, tells you more about how Verifpal can be useful for people trying to learn formal verification. One second, I need to uh, reroute the audio here. I'm not sure I can do that. 
see. Microphone. I am unable to reroute the audio. Too bad. I, we made this really funny infomercial video. I'll send the link in the chat. You guys can watch it later. I suggest you do. It is actually very, very funny. But uh, since the video is not an option, I wanted to show you more about how VerifPal works. So, oh, there's a lot, a lot of updates here. Okay. What is going on? There we go. Great. Uh, could you please let me know if you're able to see the code on your screens properly? Yeah, we can see the code. All right. So Verifpal is integrated into Visual Studio Code, which lets you like quickly uh, see a diagram of your protocol here. And you can also do stuff like uh, quickly run the analysis and Verifpal tells you whether you know queries hold up. But uh, I'm moving uh, too fast. So look, Verifpal allows you to um, describe a cryptographic protocol very easily so and get results on analyzing it very quickly. So here you have, for example, I am using the VerifPal language to describe that I have a simple protocol where Alice knows a public value, C0, generates an ephemeral key A, calculates her public key GA, right? You can see that mirrored here, sends GA to Bob, Bob knows also C0, the same value C0, generates a message and a private key, calculates their public key GB, calculates the shared secret GAB, so that's Diffie Hellman over here, sends um, GAB back to Alice with, uh, sorry, uh, well, no, uh, excuse me, uses GAB to encrypt message one using authenticated encryption with C0 as associated data. And then uh, Bob's public key and the ciphertext are sent back to Alice, right? And then Alice is also calculating the shared secret over here and then decrypting the message, right? And so the question that we're asking Verifal here is, is the message uh, confidential, right? So here we see the queries. And this is a very simple example of what formal verification tools can do. You know, Proverif works in the same way. Proverif basically, you describe what Alice is doing, you describe what Bob is doing. Now in Proverif, you also have to describe what authenticated encryption is and Verifal is, from a usability perspective superior because it includes built-in definitions for all, uh, virtually all cryptographic primitives that are useful in such protocol. And so you don't have to, uh, you don't have to like formally describe Diffie Hellman, you don't have to formally describe signatures or authentication encryption or hashing, which saves you uh, time and also uh, makes it such that the potential for user error is greatly reduced, right? Because you know, you can't mess up your definition of a signature scheme if you can't even describe it, right? And so the answer here, if we run Verifpal, and I'm going to run Verifpal a bit more explicitly by actually running Verifpal, uh, verify examples simple, this is the model. We will see that, as a matter of fact, message one is not confidential, you know? And we can see that when the attacker mutates GA, so basically we have a man in the middle attack. The attacker is changing the value of Alice's public key to a value that they control, that the attacker controls. So instead of G to the A, it's G to the evil attacker value, right? And so instead of Bob receiving Alice's public key, Bob is receiving the attacker's public key. And then Bob is encrypting the message to the attacker. So Alice's key is not authenticated. And of course, in that scenario, M1 cannot obtain confidentiality. The attacker will obtain M1 because M1 will be encrypted to the attacker, right? And so Verifile is able to catch that. And so this is possible because we have an active attacker. An attacker, an active attacker is an attacker that can um, manipulate values on the network. Now, if, if we change this to a passive attacker and run the analysis again, we will see that uh, here we have green queries, which means that these queries have passed, right? We can also change the um, uh, attacker back to active, but at the same time, add little brackets around the uh, value here. And these brackets mean that this is a guarded value, which means that the attacker cannot tamper with it. So this is a pre-authenticated value or a value exchange over a secure channel. So again, if we run the analysis here, we see that we do get confidentiality on this value since the 
Falcon cannot tamper with Alice's key, public key. However, we do not get authentication because actually the authentication of E1 is based on Alice obtaining the correct public key for Bob and not Bob obtaining the public key for Alice, the correct public key for Alice. And so the attacker is still able to impersonate Bob. Right? This is a very simple, quick example. Uh, and basically, if you if anyone in the audience has used Trovera for Tamarin before, I think you would appreciate just how much easier this is to use because these other tools are really very difficult to use compared to this. Now, of course, they have benefited from um, an enormously better and stronger amount of rigor, largely owing to the fact that they've existed for like 10, 20 years, each of them, right? Verifpile has barely existed for a single year, and they are tools that are much more well-established and can model things in the case of Tamarin, especially with much more depth. For example, Tamarin can account even for scenarios that have things like invalid curve attacks or small subgroup attacks, which are very specific kinds of attacks on specific kinds of elliptic curve based primitives, which is not something that uh, Verifpal can account for. But Verifpal is still really cool. Look, we model signal in Verifpal. This is signal, right? I am very happy with what Verifpal can do. We modeled the DP3T protocol being used by Apple and Google to do contact tracing for coronavirus in Verifpal. And we're able to quickly obtain results on that as well. Here's the you know, big old diagram also on that. Uh, this is a protocol with multiple parties also, and we're able to obtain. Uh, so generally speaking, I think, you know, I think honestly for you guys, Noise Explorer is way more valuable than Verifpal because you're not going to be in the business of designing protocols from scratch. You're going to be in the business of describing protocols within an existing framework that gives you like a set of ground rules, a set of grounding rules even. And Noise Explorer can help you quickly understand the trade-offs and the security goals achieved for each protocol given your use case. But I still, you know, think Verifpal is cool for people more interested in formal verification, can quickly obtain analysis results and protocols, and it gives you more flexibility than Noise Explorer. Switch back here. I see that there is a discussion between Akeem, Robert, Giorgio, and Paul. Mm. Paul is saying, okay, I, I, I agree with everything Paul is saying. Okay, um, I guess that's it for me in terms of the presentation. Are there any other questions or anything else you would like me to address? Thank you so much, Nadim. Actually, there are some people in the audience who are in, interested in formal verification, so I'm hoping they will check out Verifpal. And thank you for the uh, uh, quick demo on that and for highlighting to me about the noise protocol framework uh, with also highlighting some of the best uh, competition on lightweight cryptography and all uh, so many things you mentioned. And I've never had a, a, a lively discussion on the webinar in between participants and also to things you've said, so thank you for that. Um, Thank you before, so much. It's a real pleasure. Excellent. Before we end, is there something you'd like to add and where can people find more about you? Um, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Roberto, uh, for your comment uh, and Miriam. Uh, in terms of, well, uh, you could, I guess, uh, hold on. Did we even finish the slides? <laughs> Um, no, yeah, we did finish this slide. Great. So this is this is my website. Darn. Yeah. Here is my personal website, and also my company's website. My company is, you know, not really a company. It's just three people. We are actually a company, but we're very, very, very small. It's just me and two research assistants, and we do good work and we do security audits. And um, if you want us to do security audits for you. Please hire us. We will do a lot of nice security audits. And um, you can go to my personal website, learn more about my work, uh, academic publications, and so on. Um, basically, I also have this podcast you can check out. Um, and uh, if you like Othello, I recently uh, have you know this pet project, which is an AI that plays Othello, which is an old board game that's very popular in Japan. And so you can try to beat it. It's a lot of fun. Uh, yes, yes that, that is the extent of what I have to share with you. Very good. Um, uh, Frederick asked if the slides will be made available. We will make the video recording available. Uh, and if uh, Nadim make, uh, sends us the slide, then we will make them available on the uh, webinar uh, landing page. Sure, I will send the slides. Great. 
Thank you so much, Nadim, and thank you for the participants. Goodbye. I very much appreciate it. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you again. Bye.